Welcome to another edition of On the Bookshelf. I'm Pete Solomon. Meet the fictional character Hal Emerson. Hal works for a company that also does business with the government. He's a dutiful father and a husband. One night, he returns to his own home where he stumbles upon a crime being committed there by his neighbor. Suddenly, he's the chief suspect in the crime and in peril because the bad guys are chasing him too. Suddenly, nothing is as it seems. Think Kafka's The Trial or the priceless Alfred Hitchcock film North by Northwest. It takes all of Hal Emerson's wits and resourcefulness to avoid peril from each side. The name of the book Hal is featured in is Reality Checks. Now meet the author of Reality Checks, Bill Stamper. He reads an excerpt. Okay, I have to set the stage for the reading. Uh, the main character is returning to his home unexpectedly because he is uh, trying to win a big contract and has been on vacation, had planned on just coming in the next day, but decides he needs to go home uh, and spend a night at his house before his presentation. Um, and they had asked a neighbor to watch the house while they were gone. So with that said, I'm gonna do a, a short reading. Opening the door into the house, he took two steps into the family room and froze. Bob Sands, his neighbor, stared at him from the breakfast nook. Bob's wife, Marita, at Bob's right hand, Ashen. Five other men glared at him. What's going on? Why are you in my house? Hal stepped back, his eyes fixed on Sands. Hal, what are you doing here? Sands said. Everyone, this is Hal. He owns his house. His tone said, don't panic. The hair on the back of Hal's neck stood up and an awful sinking sensation started in the pit of his stomach and worked its way down his legs. Marita's eyes darted from one rough looking man to the next, then to Bob, waiting for someone to react. A huge black man, at least 6'6 and 250, guarded the family room window in front of Hal. A short, heavy-set Hispanic man guarded the front door, and in the breakfast nook, a red-haired man guarded the back window, shifting his malicious gaze between the backyard and Hal. His icy blue eyes fixed on Hal, and a cruel smirk highlighted a jagged scar on his right cheek. Two of the others, a 30-ish black man and a grandfatherly man with a comb-back white hair and a large head, stood at the table. In front of them, an open suitcase faced away from Hal. Hal wanted to back out the door he'd entered, but his feet wouldn't move. What are you people doing here, he said. He regretted it as soon as he said it. The men tensed visibly, and the big black man turned away from the window, a gun in his right hand. Hal looked straight into the shaking barrel, pointed at his gun. Although the black man's hand shook, his finger held tightly to the trigger. Hal froze, knowing if he moved, he'd be shot. His stomach tightened and his leaden legs turned weak, but he forced his gaze back to Bob. You came in at a bad time, Hal, said Bob, but you might walk away from this. Sit on the floor and put your head between your legs. Don't look up. Hal sat cross-legged, looking down at the carpet and feeling sick, certain he was about to die. Then the front door burst inward, knocking the Hispanic-looking man behind it onto his back. FBI, a voice yelled, come out with your hands over your heads. The house went dark. As Hal raised his head, the big man's gun exploded, flashing brightly in the darkness. The front window shattering as the man fired at unseen targets outside. Other guns blasted a response. The sliding glass door behind Hal exploded inward and sprayed him with broken glass. People shouted and scrambled in the den as bullets ripped through the room and slammed into the walls, floors, and furniture. The big man's breathing rasped in the darkness and Hal hugged the floor as someone moaned, oh God, oh God, oh God. When he recognized his own voice, he stopped. From the darkened front hallway, someone cried out in agony, then the house went silent. Thinking he had an opportunity to get away, Hal backed toward the garage, 
but a shotgun barrel stabbed him in the back of the neck, twitching as if its owner could barely control it. Don't even breathe, a female voice said. Donnie, I caught one of them trying to sneak out the back door. Nice work, a man's voice said as someone flipped on the lights. The big black man lay on his back, staring lifelessly at the ceiling, bleeding everywhere. In the breakfast nook, the white-haired man with the big head lay in a pool of blood, and a man in black knelt over him, holding an M16 in one hand and feeling for a pulse with the other. The man in charge stood near the black man's body. Donnie, the guy by the front door is dead, someone said. What about the ones that ran out the back, Donnie said. We found Petrov out cold. Same with Sammy and Dave. Ambulance is coming. Dave hasn't come too. Sammy and Petrov will have to get checked out. So they took out everyone we had in the back. Donnie turned beet red. What about the bad guys? The county police have surrounded the area. We'll get them. Donnie pounded the wall with his fist. We had them cold. Now we got armed criminals running around a quiet neighborhood and three dead bodies? The gun barrel pushed at Hal's necks. Don't move, the voice said. I'm gonna cuff you. A small hand jerked his wrists behind his back. Then the handcuffs went on and he heard them lock, each with a loud click. This is wrong, Hal said. I just walked in the door. I don't even know these people. Read the scum its rights, Cheryl. Rose glared at him and spat. You are under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. Bill Stamper, thanks for a taste of your book, Reality Checks. And thank you for coming to On the Bookshelf. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank as you. Well. Before we talk about the book, let's talk a little bit about you. Now, you were born in Huntington, Indiana, where you were raised, the Lime City, right? The Lime City, that's right. Pretty good place to grow up? It was. One of the things that you have said before is that you were very much influenced when you were a child by an English teacher, Mother Fisher. Could you talk about her? Well, Mother Fisher um, was uh, a victim of cerebral palsy. And so she had a tremendous uh, difficulty getting around the school. Um, she had uh, speech problems, but she loved the English language and she was able to convey that to her students. She taught uh, an honors English class that, that selected certain students out of, the, out of the entire school to be in that class. And her students used to, to uh, between classes, because she couldn't get there in time, uh, she would sit in her chair with rollers on it, and students would roll her to the, to the next class, which was kind of cool. But uh, Mother and, and Fisher was a very demanding, very exacting uh, teacher. And um, she inspired, I think, everybody that, that had her for, a, for an instructor. Well, she'd certainly be proud of what you've accomplished. Thank you. Now, from, uh, from Huntington, you wound up in West Lafayette. You uh, went to Purdue University. And when you graduated, you had a degree in civil engineering. But I know you were sort of wavering on what your major might be at one point, right? I was. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be good at science and math in school as well as English. And so I, I was sort of leaning toward uh, maybe journalism or something along that line, which would have been Indiana University probably instead of Purdue. Mm -hmm. uh, but my parents were pretty much against that and felt like um, I could be a writer if I wanted to, but I needed to have a solid, uh, a more solid degree that I could, uh, the almost a quote that I could make a living at. And uh, a living you made when you worked for the Indiana State Department of Transportation, and you were involved with the U.S. Air Force, and uh, later with NASA, so I guess it, it is rocket science. <laughs> what were those experiences like? Uh, I had a great career as an engineer. I, I didn't last very long with the Indiana uh, Department of Transportation, primarily because I found out that it was a political organization. And uh, the only people who didn't have to tithe to the party in power at that time were, were the engineers because they couldn't hire engineers. 
if they made them do that. Now, in your book, a lot of the people who are involved in entities in, in the uh, in the public sector, um, the FBI, ultimately the, the CIA, uh, government jobs uh, and people who work in government jobs are a little different than people who work in the private sector. Did this factor into your creating the characters? Well, I would dispute that they're any different. Uh, I think, uh, by and large, they're just people who have accepted a different job opportunity than the person next door. Mm -hmm. uh, what is different is once you get in, if you get into the world of security clearances, uh, then you have to be more careful about what you do and who you associate with. And, and if you live in the Washington, D.C. area especially, you kind of get used to the fact that so-and-so has got a clearance and, and um, when clearances get renewed, people get sent to your house and they say, your, your next door neighbor has a clearance coming up. Uh, what can you tell us about them? Interesting. So it, it's, from that standpoint, it's a little different environment, but you, probably unique to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. and its environs are a very big part of your book. Uh, this area is almost like a character in your book. Uh, can you talk about what it's like to live in a, an area of the country where so many people are involved in government work and so many people are involved with the people who are involved in government work? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting area to live in. Uh, your next door neighbor might be with the CIA or might, might be, uh, you know, a security cop at the Pentagon. It, 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 it is across the board. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities for people there. Young people tend to flock there uh, for the political positions on Capitol Hill and other places. But the, the older people uh, tend to gravitate there because of a job opportunity at some point in their, in their life. Um, but it's, it's an interesting environment to live in. Not that other cities are not. Every, I think every area that you live in has its own, own culture and environment to offer. Indeed. Writers are usually readers. Were there writers who influenced you when you were a young person? Um, probably not so much when I was young. I, I read a lot of Terry Brooks, um, and the, he's a fantasy writer primarily, but he, the way he structured a novel, I, I liked um, the, the way he did that, the flow, uh, having multiple things going on at the same time in different areas. I liked the point of view he used. And so uh, I guess if there was sort of a model for that, it'd be him. And more recently, I've liked David Baldacci. Mm -hmm. um, I like his work quite a bit. As do I. Now, it's interesting, I think, Bill, that um, you wrote this book while you were juggling your family and professional responsibilities. How was the writing process? Well, it was that, that's difficult, and I think it's difficult for just about anybody that that tackles trying to write uh, novels while they're working full time and raising a family. Uh, you have to find time to do it. And at times you put it down and then you come back to it and you don't know where you were and you have to sort of restart. So it's, it's a much longer process. Did you try to write at the same time every night or did you just write when you got a free minute? I wrote on airplanes, in airport terminals, on vacations. Any, any time that I could find time to do it that I wasn't taking away from family time. If I got an opportunity to see the first draft of Reality Checks, how different would it be from the book that I read? A lot. Um, the, I probably had 13 drafts, and they got progressively shorter. So the, the final product is the shortest version and there's a lot less background and a lot more action. Did the characters sort of carry you along at one point? You suddenly, the, the character, as you were typing, the characters sort of led you in a certain direction? I don't know where these characters came from in some ways. They, they seem to have a life of their own, and I never have been a violent person or anything like that, but somehow some of that came out of my pen as, as well. Interesting. Um, the, the story just just sort of, it started with a simple idea, which is 
uh, I traveled a lot. And uh, at, at, at the beginning of that time, I was single and neighbors would take my house key and watch over my house for me. And it just hit me, what if one of those neighbors wasn't real honest? So that little nugget stayed in my mind. And when I started to, to write the book, I expanded on that idea. And there was a dishonest neighbor. And, and it, kind of, it grew from there. But again, I'm not quite sure where all the characters came from. They just sneak, sneaked in somehow. Now, I, I want to talk about the characters, but I want to be very careful because the book takes so many twists and turns, and I certainly don't want to spoil anything for people who want to read Reality Checks, but we should begin with the protagonist, Tal Emerson, who's a, a guy who seems to be just trying to make his way in life. He wants to move up professionally. He wants to hold his marriage together, and uh, he has some real challenges. Um, he, he's an interesting character. Could you elaborate on uh, how you created him? Well... Hal, I think, at the beginning of the book is is sort sort of he's trying to be a nice guy, thinks that's the way you get ahead. Um, but as somebody tells him along the way, this is Washington D.C. man; it doesn't work that way. Uh, and he learns that. But he also, uh, over the course of the experiences he has in this book, becomes more cynical at the same time, much less an innocent soul when he starts. Well, since people heard you introduce the book with the excerpt about the, the crime that begins the roller coaster road that Hal find, uh, ride that Hal finds himself in, uh, Bob Sands, his neighbor, is not such a nice guy. <laughs> no, he's not. But uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Hal. Um, in, the, in the book, um, I tried to explain why Bob Sands isn't such a nice guy. And it's based on experiences he had as well. But that doesn't mean he's not a bad guy. It just no. means the reader might understand why. Well, to say he had a challenging upbringing would really be an understatement, wouldn't mm -hmm. it? And uh, some of the characters that are, uh, I, I'm not going to say minor characters, but Secondary characters, uh, his wife Marita, there are some real twists and turns uh, as she moves on. Um, John Eccles is the project manager who Hal works under. And ultimately, one by one, we find out that these people have interesting pasts and secrets. And one of the real challenges for Hal, we know from your reading, that uh, he's suddenly accused of a crime he didn't commit, uh, and he has to use everything within him to try to stall long enough to be able to prove his innocence. And one by one, he's not sure who to trust, and everybody seems to have a backstory. That's right. And I, I feel like that's, that's one of the themes that I was after in the book, is that, and I think it's probably true of most people, that there's, there's someone else inside that you don't necessarily show to the world. And so um, I, I tried to portray that in the book to say, yes, every character basically has something else going on that uh, they, they don't share with other people. In your reading, we met Donnie Rose, who uh, works for the FBI and becomes the lead investigator in this case. And we ultimately learn, and I don't think this will spoil anything, that 14 years ago he lost his partner and he's been trying to avenge that ever since. That's a key element to, to the way he approaches his job, isn't it? it? It definitely is. And we learned that about him in the, in the prologue, so we're not giving away too much. Exactly. <laughs> but yes, he, that uh, event, he blames himself for that death because he was the more experienced hand and it colors everything he does after that day. And the Cheryl that you referenced in the reading is Cheryl Washington and she's an ambitious young agent hoping to move up in the, in the company. Yes, she, uh, she's African American. Um, she doesn't understand that why she's not getting the more difficult assignments. She doesn't understand that Rose won't give those assignments to anybody new because that's what happened to his first partner. Uh, so she thinks it's because she's a female and because she's African-American. And really, Rose isn't nice to anybody. So she's interpreting 
may be a little wrong, but from her perspective, that's what she sees. Which just underscores the fact that the characters uh, in, in the book, no matter uh, how big or small their parts are, are very richly drawn. Thank you. Um, it's interesting that uh, some of the bad guys are, are Russians involved in the drug trade, and it's, it's interesting because the book was published in 2011, and yet um, Russia and Russians are, are still so in the news now. It, it turns out to be uh, very timely. Well, I think they've always been uh, in, in news, at least in my lifetime. The Russians have always been the villains. Whether they really are or not, uh, it's somewhat of a, of a caricature probably. They're people just like we are. But uh, when I needed characters that, and, and a drug source from Russia, then that's where these characters came from. A minute ago, Bill, we touched briefly on Washington and its environs and how integral it is to the book. Uh, I know that you lived in, in uh, Northern Virginia, in Burke, Virginia, right, for, for yes. a while. Uh, and uh, I wonder, as uh, Hal moves uh, one step ahead to try to get enough time to be able to try to prove his innocence, uh, he, he has to keep moving and keep ahead of the FBI, and he, of course, uh, um, the, the Russians want him as well, uh, and he visits uh, various inns, and are all the places he goes to based on real places? Most of them are. And if you can't tell the difference, then I did my job. <laughs> well, I can't and you did. <laughs> no, most, most of them are based on, on real places. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Hal, um, at the very beginning, is on vacation with his family and uh, decides to come home early because of the project that you talked about. Uh, and this creates uh, his coming home a night early and, and returning to his house while a crime is, is in progress. Um, this is an interesting element of the book because it seems as though his involvement is really serendipitous, isn't it? It is. He just, it's wrong place at the right time. It, and it makes him look really guilty. But it seems like in, in challenging himself and working so hard, again, to buy enough time to prove his innocence, there's a strength in Hal that we, we haven't seen uh, in, in the early parts of the book in his work life and his family life. I wanted to bring that out. This character does grow. Uh, but he doesn't become Superman. No. He, he, he never does anything in the book. He doesn't turn into a karate expert or superhero. He's just a guy. And he does what he has to do to stay alive. And you give us a good look inside his head, his thought processes, as he faces his challenge after challenge, as one of the things that, that makes one continue to, to read the book and work, work the way to the, the denouement. That was a, 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 an interesting uh, part of his, his being, and, uh, because Hal, in, in so many cases, is sort of every man, isn't he? I, I hope he is. Hmm. Uh, I hope any of us could put ourselves in his shoes, and some of us have been in the wrong place at, at the right time, or uh, however you say that. It happens. We've been trying to be careful about not giving away too much of the narrative, and so we've been talking a lot about the characters. Uh, are, are the characters based in any way on people you, you've known? Some are. Well, I, I, I won't ask you to identify anybody, but I will ask you, do you think that people read your book and said, hey, that could be me? Um, maybe, maybe. Um, one sp specific uh, character has a temper. Um, probably a few people that I've worked with would see themselves in that character. Interesting. Interesting. Would it have been a different book had you not worked in the places you worked in, uh, in, in and, and the periphery of government work? I, th I think we're all colored by our, our own background and experiences. Yes, it would have been a different book. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that the basics of the plot would have been a, a lot different. It's more the, the details, uh, the, the contract environment, those kind of things. Because I worked in that vi environment, I was very familiar with that side of it. So, at, at one time or another, all authors have been told, write what you know. That's right. Now, um, 
you sort of left the door open for a sequel. Is that a possibility? It's a possibility. I would never say never. Mm -hmm. uh, right now I'm in writing a, a series and uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes, but I may come back to Hal and Marita. At some I, point. I, for one, hope you do. In, in the meantime, I, I want to ask you about The Last Sorcerer and the books that will follow. Can you just give us a taste of what they're, those books are like? Well, The Last Sorcerer series, I've, I've just finished the um, first book of that series and sent it in for copyright registration. Mm -hmm. uh, it tells a story of uh, somebody who finds out that he has the blood of a sorcerer. So this is more, it, I wouldn't call it fantasy. Um, there's a little bit of religion, a little bit of fantasy, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's set 20, 30 years in the future. And he um, doesn't know that he has this in him. It's been kept a secret by his adoptive mother, who is also his aunt. Uh, what was more challenging, writing reality, uh, ch reality checks or writing The Last Sorcerer? Uh, the Last Sorcerer. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's more difficult, uh, for me at least, because I'm having to project what the world is like in 20 or 30 years without becoming, uh, I don't think we just get into a dysfunctional society um, like so many movies and things have been written. What, what's really going to, if you look 30 years ago at what the world will look like today, we, we didn't become a dysfunctional society, dystopia, uh, but we did progress in science and math and the weather is different and so many things are different. So it's, it's hard to do that. Is it fair to say that writing The Last Sorcerer was more of an outlet for your own imagination than reality checks? No, I think any, to me, any fiction you write is, is the outlet. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing is to keep writing. In talking about keep uh, continuing to write, somewhere down the road, uh, is it possible that you may tackle a different genre or? Um... Yeah, I have four other books that I've written the first chapter mm -hmm. because I didn't want to lose the idea. Sure. And so I have a list of things I want to go after. How long did it take you to write reality checks? Oh, uh, off and on 10 years at mm -hmm. least. But now that you've written that, and of course now that you can devote more time to your writing, subsequent books will take a little less time, and uh, probably having uh, developed your writing process, that'll make life easier, right? It will. I think maybe one a year might be aggressive, mm -hmm. but one every 10 years is, sure. I, I don't need to worry about that anymore. I'll be faster than that. What kind of feedback did you get on reality checks? I, I got a lot of uh, good comments I've, I've done some library book signings, I've done book clubs um, and some other events, and most people say I couldn't put it down. Well, I, I will echo that, Bill Stamper. It was a pleasure to meet you. We're delighted that you were able to come and visit us on On the Bookshelf, and we wish you nothing but good luck in your future endeavors. Well, thank you very much, and same to you, Pete. Very thank nice you. to meet you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this edition of On the Bookshelf. Mm -hmm.